Hey, it's another Thursday here. We are within the conversation. It's going to be outspoken and opinionated, of course. It's Thursday, 7 p.m. in my little studio over here. I have an amazing Liberia Excellence Edition for you guys. LIB Takeover. We're celebrating Liberia. So for y'all having noticed, I'm in my Liberian t-shirt. Yes, I told you guys last week, we need to go back to True Vision and let this man know he needs to produce more of these shirts because it's like amazing. So this is a Liberian shirt two years ago. Um, we are back with the conversation. I've spoken and opinionated. I am, of course, the host, Edwin J. Um, we have an amazing show for you guys today. We've been going over the entire Liberian excellence. We've been celebrating July 26th. been celebrating Liberia with some amazing Liberians. So today is none other than um, Dr. Patrick Boros who's going to give us I can't wait because I know I'm going to gain so much knowledge today. But if you are not following us, we are on Facebook. D conversation, outspoken and opinionated people. We're on Instagram, D conversation. We are on YouTube, D conversation, outspoken and opinionated. And guess what? We are on Spotify. So if you're in your car, if you are at work, or whatever it is that you want to do, you want to hear our past podcast with amazing people we've had on the had on the show, go to Spotify, download us. You hear my voice. I'm gonna be there. But before we even start the show today, I want to really speak out to my people in Liberia. You guys, we know what's going on. COVID is crazy. I'm asking you guys, if you have not taken your vaccine, if you have an opportunity, go ahead and take one. COVID is real, guys. I told you, I have another side hustle where I do go and I've seen COVID patients. It is real. I have friends. I, have a real, I had a really good friend who did die from COVID vaccine here in the States. And it is not a joke. He was 34 years old. I'm asking you, for those who are watching, if you're in Liberia, if you can't get a vaccine, go and get a vaccine. We ask you to wear your mask. We're asking you to sit, hand sanitize. Do, do all the precautions, everything that you've been hearing that is on the news, everything followed. We're asking you guys to protect yourself, protect your family so that we can protect the nation. But again, this is the conversation. And I'm going to just bring Dr. Boris in because that's why we're here. Welcome, Dr. Boris. Well, thank you so much, EJ, for the invitation. Glad uh, to be here. We appreciate you for uh, accepting the invitation, for coming on this, uh, 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 being on this platform. We want to say welcome to the conversation. It is outspoken. It is opinionated. Uh, we don't, we just say what, what we need. We say what needs to be said. And that's mm -hmm. what we do here. So we're glad that you're here. We are celebrating Liberia's independence. Um, I call it hashtag LIB Takeover 2021. So how have you been with COVID and everything? How has that been? Well, I want to echo what you said earlier because I, I have friends in Liberia as well. And I know, you know, it has hit really hard, not only in Monrovia, but in uh, Suakoko where I used to live. So I just want to say to those folks, um, yeah, EJ, you're absolutely right. If people have access, go ahead and take the vaccine. I've had mine, there were no major side effects. Everyone in my family has had and no side effects, you know, to report. So a lot of videos are circulating and a lot of misinformation, but um, to tell you the truth, I think the evidence is overwhelming. The vaccine uh, makes a difference and uh, we need to go ahead and, 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 and take care of that. And you know, EJ, I just want to um, add something here. Mm -hmm. it's, I can't help it because I'm a historian. You know, people don't appreciate the fact that Africans were the ones who brought vaccination to the U.S. There were enslaved Africans here when smallpox hit, and they were vaccinating their uh, relatives and others, and um, other Americans observed this and uh, adopted that practice. So they would take the, vi the, 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 the virus and introduce it into the body by sticking the person um, so that you know they'll be able to to, to put um, the vaccine in the body, in the bloodstream, and yeah, and so the historical record is there. Um, but now we've become um, so enamored of the idea that that everything new or, or all technology comes from outside, and we are so um, lacking in knowledge of our contributions, you know, to science and, and to history, and so. Um, when we realize that this, this is a technology that our ancestors invented, 
<laughs> it's not something strange, you know? So I just want to throw that out. And just for you to say that, um, if people don't know, the person who actually came out with the entire, did the entire research to come up with the COVID vaccine, is a, is a black woman. Yes. Henry and I went to college together. Oh, wow. Amazing Thank black girl, amazing yeah. African-American girl from North Carolina. So, yeah. you know, there is some kind of roots to yeah. West Africa. Yeah. So if people don't know, the lady who came up with the entire research, her entire team is a black woman. Dr. Kesey. So, you know, when we come up, when people come up with all these things, oh, the vaccine is coming and going to do this, it's going to do that, it's going to do the other. I'm just like, look, guys, you take flu vaccine, you take po you're taking polio, you're taking all the other vaccines. Can you explain to me why this is an issue? Yeah. But, you know, we have all our understanding, all these little different stereotypes and all these little conversation on the side that people want to have and to to, to repeat. So detour people from the real news, but hey, I'm just gonna let people know. I saw the one of the first few COVID patients real life. Sure. And it is not a good sign. Right. So okay. I tell people, please go ahead. If you can't get a vaccine, if you're in Liberia, get a vaccine. But protect yourself, wear your mask, hand sanitize, and do everything you can do to protect you and your family so we can protect the nation. Mm -hmm. But let's just go and talk up so. Dr. Burris, so who are you? What do you do? Just give us a little, you know, yeah. background of who you are. I think there are two things about me that I would like to uh, introduce to the audience, right? The first is that I am a historian and a humanities uh, uh, scholar. Okay. And that means basically that my focus is on who are we, where have we been, so that we can understand where we're headed. And it's impossible to understand who you are if you don't know where you're coming from. So those three are really critical. Um, and, and that's professionally, you know, you could say that's, that's what I'm about. But the second thing I want to also introduce to the audience up front, and I make no apologies about this, is that I'm an Africanist. And what that means is that in looking at African traditions and African history, I'm looking from the inside. I'm looking and judging these standards from the perspective of Africans. I don't look at our history from, uh, from without, you know, how do the Chinese regard us or how do white Americans regard us or any other nationality for that matter. Um, and I think it makes a huge difference. It's very, very important. So I know you, you are familiar with a book I did. It's called, uh, between the Kola Forest and the Salty Sea. And it's a history of uh, Liberians before 1800. Mm -hmm. When I published that book, I was doing uh, a tour. I would you know, have book talks. And invariably, people would come to me, pick up the book and say, oh, uh, is Pedro de Centra in this book? Pedro de Centra was the first Portuguese who came you know, around the Cape and, and, and turned around when he hit Liberia. And, um, yeah, I mentioned Pedro de Centra in the book, um, maybe in the middle, towards the middle of the book. But you see, the, the question has something built in. It tells me something about the person who's asking the question and their perspective. And from their perspective, our story begins when the Portuguese arrive. Mm -hmm. Or of all the things that have happened in our history, the arrival of the Portuguese and the arrival of Europeans and the involvement of the American colonization society will be elevated to the peak. But we know very little and we're happy with not knowing, you know, the rest of the story. And, and so to be an Africanist means that, you know, one approaches it from a very different lens altogether. I like that we even started with that because as a kid growing up in Liberia, I've said this all the time. Um, I think for me, I really valued my culture, my tradition, and my heritage when I moved to the States. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in Liberia, it's just you just live. Mm -hmm. But if you come to a different country where there is some line of demarcation, you realize that who you are, you realize that your color means something, your accent means something. Who you as an individual means something. And so I just want to talk about this because I know somebody have asked this question and we like went back and forth. This guy asked and said, he's a Liberian. And he said, well, you know, they said Liberia was the first independent state. But was Liberia really not colonized? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting question. And um, yes. I'll try to be simple about it. Okay. Most countries that were colonized in the world, 99%, um, I would say, you know, the throughout a, a percentage figure, most countries in the world were colonized by another country. Mm -hmm. So Sierra Leone, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, were all colonized by Britain, Great yes. Britain. France colonized Guinea, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Liberia was unique because it was a colony of a private association. And that association was the American Colonization Society. But one of the reasons why um, the colonization of Liberia is not really regarded you know, on the same level as the rest of African countries or other countries for that matter, is that the ACS control of Liberia was very brief. Okay. It was like 20 something years. And within that time, Liberians decided, you know what, we are going on our own, we declare our independence. And that was over, that phase was over very quickly. So even if we take into account that brief period of being held a colony by a private group, the reality is, and nobody can take this from us, is that Liberia was the first, right, African Republic. It was the second black Republic after Haiti, Haiti. but it was the first Republic on the continent of Africa. And it was independent when all the other territories were being held by European powers. And I think that, 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 that information, that question, whatever leads into another one where it was basically like, okay, so if we were not, why is it that, you know, our flag is like the American flag? Our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, um, national anthem have similarities like the Liberian flag. There are states, there are counties in Liberia that's like in America. Um, James Monroe, Monroe was after him. So, you know, they come to this place and say like, okay, I think we were colonized, but like you said, because it was a brief time and then at the time where other states, other countries, I'm sorry, were colonized and we weren't, is that, does that have to do anything with this huge amount of, I'm trying to find a word, a better word, so I don't use the word I want to use, a influence, a huge amount of influence of the Americans on Liberia? Well, you see, a lot of a lot of different places have had influence on Liberia, right? And the mm -hmm. U.S. influence has been important, mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. But I always would like to let Liberians understand that that power is important in the world. Okay. If you have a differential of power, those who have it will have great influence on those who do not. But I don't mean to talk about power only in a political sense. That, that is important power, you know, and financial power is important also. But it's possible to have power in other ways and in the cultural sense. We don't think about that too often, but you can have power, cultural power, and you can influence other people. You follow me? Yeah. So, okay, if we look at Liberia, a lot of people assume that you have places named Kepalmas, Cape mm -hmm. Mount, St. John River, St. Paul River, that somehow these names were bestowed by Americans or by the repatriates who came from America. It's not true. Those names were given by the Portuguese. And the Portuguese came in the, the middle of the 1400s AD. So that's like 400 years or so before some of our ancestors came from America to, the, to, the, to that area that we call Liberia. So the Portuguese come, they put these names, but because they have that power, they were the great empire of that day. The names that they assigned stuck. And it was not just names that they assigned to, to places in Liberia, but they had influence in other ways. Liberians don't realize that Portuguese is a part of our colloquia and it's part of uh, West African pigeon. So the word palava, we say palava hut, a palava mm -hmm. sauce. Mm -hmm. It's a Portuguese word originally, but we have taken it, you know what I mean? And we baptize it in our culture and we flip it in, in ways that they didn't use it. Um, Portuguese is, is embedded in some of the, the, the local languages in Liberia. Um, because you see, if a technology comes like a watch, and it's new, 
then we have to find a way to express a name for this thing in the local language. You follow me? Yeah. And when the Portuguese came, they brought certain technologies that we didn't have. So then the name that they were using for it became a part of the, the local language. Um, so yes, the, the Americans uh, had a great deal of influence, you know, in, in, in Liberia as well. Uh, but their influence has been mainly political and economic. And you are able to project, you know, your strength outward to other people. What we don't recognize oftentimes, or we downplay, we, we, we dismiss, is the fact that Africans, including our ancestors, have had great cultural power. And so if you look at popular music in America, the roots of a lot of different genres in America is strictly African, you know, be it jazz, R&B, and some influence in the even into the country area, country music, um, rock and roll, African at the base of it. You look at American cuisine, you know, there's African influence there as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the people who are overlooked, the ones who are lacking political power, their culture can also get projected, you know, very far. And it can influence the people who have the money and such. So it's a two-way street. Yeah, so since we are talking about the Liberian people, I want to have, I want to suggest if we can just talk a little bit about before the settlers came to Liberia. I think, like I said, most often we aren't, we don't hear anything about these people. We don't hear anything about, okay, so what was going on before uh, um, the settlers came, before the people that we consider in Liberia to be called the miracle Liberians, before they settled in Liberia. What was going on there? What was going on with this land? What was happening? And like you said, you did write a book that talk about the history before 1800. Yeah. And so if you can just give us some, you know, just some great insight on, you know, what was going on on that land before the only information that we have has started from 1847. Sure. So EJ, before I get into the details of it, I, I also want to make a point, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is the unfortunate situation we face as Liberians is that, um, we went through a war, uh, and even before that war, the problem had already started of uh, divisions. Yeah, and that and those divisions have multiplied and they have become entrenched. Okay, and so as a historian, I monitor social media in a way. I see in a discussion of our history. I'm there. I'm watching. I'm looking. I spent thirty something years working on that book. You know, researching and and and, and writing it. Um, and what I come to realize is that there are a lot of Liberians on social media who discuss our history from a political perspective, ideological perspective. They, they dislike everything that has to do with American Liberians. But the reality is they do not love the history of indigenous Liberians. Mm. Do you hear me? Yes, I agree. I would like for your audience to hear me clearly. Mm -hmm. To hate another group of people is not to say that you also love the others. And the reality is that's where we are stuck. I agree. Until we can uh, uh, ground ourselves in a, in a love for that which is ours in a holistic way, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so to spend 30 something years writing a book or doing research for a book, it means that you really have to love what you're doing. I agree. Now, all right, having spent that long time, well, there is a summary of, of what I would, would say to your audience. Liberia is so important to the, the history of this world. And we just play around with that place and we, 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 we have been gifted something wonderful by our ancestors. But because we disrespect them, we denigrate them, we look down on them, we then also look down on the gifts that they have given us. And so here's one thing. Liberia is actually like the crossroads of West Africa. The languages of West and Southern Africa all share a common root. They are all known as the Niger-Congo language family. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the roots of Niger-Congo have been traced far north to the area in what is now the Sahara. That's where it started. And at that time, the Sahara was green and our ancestors were living up there. 
But as the ants, the, the, the Sahara began to turn into a desert because of climate change, people started moving, moving away from the heat, moving away from the destruction. You couldn't grow food. There was no water. So people started going south and they usually went where the water was. So as we were moving, the group, the, 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 the original group split into three. I'll be simple about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the group that went along the coast of West Africa, linguists call them the Atlantic speakers, the Atlantic language speakers, but they are part of the Niger Congo. The other group came down the middle. They are called the Mende speakers. Mende, not Mende, but Mende. Mende and okay. included, I'll come back to talk about who's included in this group. And then there's a third group that came uh, from around Burkina Faso. They came down to Cote d'Ivoire and they came to Liberia around Grand Gide. And that group, linguists call them crew speakers, not crew ethnic group, but the crew speakers. Because what you have is that with the crew language, Kron, uh, Kribo, crew, Basa, you know, they, they are all part of that language. If you look at it, how can you tell? You look at the way people count, you know, one, two, three, four, five. The similarity is there. Okay. Those are the basic words that people started off with early. So when everything else is changed, those tend to be stuck. In the middle, the Mende speaking people include Pele, Loma, Malinke, in Liberia, we say Mandingo, you know what I mean? Vibe. Those are all part of that group. And then on the other side, the Atlantic speakers will be in Liberia now. Uh, the uh, Gola and the um, the Kisi. But there are other Atlantic speakers going all the way up like Wolof. Mm -hmm. And so the Atlantic speakers identified with the cultivation of rice. That's one reason why in West Africa we talk about Jollof rice. It's related to Wolof. So the rice culture spread with the Atlantic speakers that came down. The Kisi were known to be prof you know, very profuse uh, uh, rice growers at one time. Um, and other, other groups that came, they brought different gifts. You know, they brought different aspects to contribute to the culture that we have in Liberia today, right? So in Liberia, you have the rice culture meeting. On the, on the southeastern side, uh, a lot of root were staples, like okay. yam and edo. And then when cassava came, they got added there. So those tended to be very important on the other side, right? All of us, we eat palm oil. I mean, mm -hmm. as, as, you know, across the board, right? Um, but it's that, that mixing uh, uh, of different flavors. I like to think of it in that way, not just in terms of the cuisine, but also in terms of the, the broader culture. Uh, that, that, that's part of what makes us uh, uh, who we are. So the, the, the flow of people coming down to Liberia from the north, the uh, ancestors of the Gola and the, the Gisi would have arrived um, somewhere around 700 AD. We have, we found, uh, archaeologists have found, you know, relics, bones, other things, you know, pots, potteries and stuff. Um, so we can, and they dated them. So they came, and then the, the people on the other side, the Grand Gita side, they would have come a few hundred years later. Okay. And we are able to link them with others from Burkina Faso because the design that they would put on the pots were similar. Mm -hmm. And then the Pele and the Loma came later, and the Malinke came when the Mali Empire collapsed, and that would have been around 1400s. So you have people continuously coming into this territory. Initially, when, when our ancestors came, they didn't penetrate all the way into the forest. They were sitting near the edge of the forest, right? Right around the border of Guinea. But then later on, they gradually started making their way in the forest because the forest is a formid formidable you know, environment. And then that's where we met. We met in this forest area and we began to exchange intermarry, you know, and, and so forth. Wow. That was amazing. That, but you started with a little conversation on, you know, the indigenous people and what we consider as the miracle Liberians. 
And so as a boy growing up, I have always heard this thing and Liberians don't like for people to say, but I'm just gonna say it. The Congo versus the country people. I've always heard this thing. And I wanna ask you as an elder, as someone who is an, you are a historian, what's, why? Why do we have this, this, this rift in Liberia when it comes to the Congo people versus the country people? Why do we have this? Well, usually when you have a riff, it's because of politics. It's because of, um, you know, it's a politics. When you carry it to the extreme, it becomes a war. And we saw it. We saw it in Liberia. Yep, we did. So, okay. So now, yes, yes, the, the situation that your generation is living with. Mm -hmm. Your uncles brought this mentality to Liberia. In their in their their fight for power among each other, you know. No, I want it. No, I want it. No, let me take it. They were using these kinds of uh, div divisions to 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 justify each you know person justifying their side. Yeah. When that thing started, I would say it would have been around 1980 when you began to hear the demonization of American Liberians for real. You know what I mean? Yeah. On, a, on the scale that we see it today. And people were oftentimes aggressively uh, approaching American Liberians. We know that some people were killed uh, after the coup and all of down the pole and so forth. Um, but th there was this hostility that was generalized, right? It, it came to be spread. People yeah. would be in the street to say, uh, Congo Umo Bon Road, Country Umo Bon Soldier. Okay. It wasn't a good 10 years later when that disease, that mindset, it's a genocidal mindset, it morphed. So the enemy shifted. After mm -hmm. there was an attempted coup by General Kuyungpa, it failed. Now, um, the head of state, Samuel Doe's army, retaliated, but not against those who planned the coup and who came into Liberia, you know, in connection with it. They retaliated against people who share the same ethnic background as Kuyungpa or who came from his county. Okay. You had innocent men, women, and children who had nothing to do with the coup, right? But suddenly, their houses were being demolished, they were being attacked, they were being raped. We, it, it stayed like that. Nobody challenged this mindset. We say, oh, it's a Liberian way. Oh, oh, oh. And then when we look so many years later, maybe 10 years or so later, the thing flipped. Taylor forces came across the border. Uh, there were many people from Nimba who were affiliated. Now the violence turned against the crown. And to a certain extent, Mandingo. Mm -hmm. A lot of innocent crown people, they had nothing to do with the, 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 the military or, or the dual administration. People went after them with vengeance. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So this cycle, it's a result wow. of a poisonous mindset. And it looks for a group to demonize. My position regarding my work in history is this. Every part has to sit on its own bottom. Mm. So if there is a, a American Liberian who has committed crimes or you know has engaged in immoral behavior, that individual should be held responsible for what he did. Okay. But to take that blame and generalize it to all people who come from that ethnic background is in it's it's unjust, it's immoral, right? It's indefensible. Mm. The same is true, I would say in regards to Kron, or Mano, or any other group in the country. If we keep doing this, generalizing blame to a whole group of people, we can't go anywhere. And that's the, 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 the dilemma, you know, that's the mindset that we're stuck in, that our uncles and others have bequeathed to your generation. It's on your generation to say, you know what, we're gonna step away from this. What happens, EJ, oftentimes in relationships? is this, 
what people say when the if, if you take the groups in Liberia, Nigeria need to use the example of a husband and wife or a couple, you know, in a relationship. When two people get together, it's all with optimism and happiness and, you know, projecting onto the future. And if you are there at the beginning, you remember how they were feeling about each other and what they were saying, uh -huh. doing, okay? But if they come to a rough spot, a rocky place, and you hear one of them cussing the other one and talking down about that person, it's up to you now to go and put your mouth inside and try to make it thick and then try to, you know, add fuel to the fire. And then when you look, the couple has split and you are helped to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Or if you're an older, mature person, you bring reasoning to it and you say, you know what, these people are having a rough spat. Uh, I can sh show some light or whatever, you know, to kind of make it uh, uh, diffuse, right? So sometimes you got to remind them, say, my man, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about like that, but I was there when y'all were getting married, oh. I remember when you're, when, you're, when you're quoting that girl, oh, and then a man starts smiling, saying, man, you're foolish, man. But at least he's reminded that that relationship has history. My point is that with Liberia, we have a long history of positive and negative things that have happened. But when we take the whole bucket with all the water, the baby, everything, and throw it out, there's nothing left. So here we are, we, 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 have, been con we have become convinced by some of our uncles that mm -hmm. like, it's nothing. It has never been anything. There's another word I want to use, but I won't use it on your show. <laughs> um, you know, parents sometimes will tell their children that, right? You ain't this. You ain't never yes. been that. You will never be this. Mm -hmm. Once you convince somebody that their past is nothing, it is it, it, filth, you already got them trapped because then it's hard for them to believe that it can ever be anything in the future. So that's my job. I'm, I'm rescuing the positive aspects of the Liberian story to share so that the generations, your generation and those coming behind you will mm -hmm. know that your ancestors have been something. Yes. You need to step up to the plate. And I like that you say that because I know for us who, um, you know, you we in a melting pot. That's how I just look at it. We are in a melting pot. We associate with everybody, especially if you're in other countries and you're not in Liberia. But you meet people from different walks and you meet different kinds of Liberians and you meet people who still have that mentality of, you know, there is this group that is supposed to be better than this group. And so, you know, it's funny because I remember as a kid growing up, there was an argument. And now I'm an adult and I still hear the same argument. And I'm like, when are we going to let this argument go? We are all Liberians. At the end of the day, we are still Liberians. So whether, like I tell them, I say, I just like the fact that my dad is from Lofa County. He is a man from the farm and he worked his way up. My mom, it's I, when I say that, she gets upset, but I tell her, I say, you're a privilege. Your life was given to you, you know, and you just enjoyed it. So being that I was able to deal with both sides of that life, whether I'm with my dad, who like he's really straight things are supposed to be a certain way because he worked for everything he has. And it's like when I try to tell my friends that, like, well, maybe it's the Congo side or it's the country side. And I'm like, there is no side. I think we're Liberians. And I want to move into this place where I just want to talk about Liberian culture. Mm -hmm. I so what I, I would say in response, EJ, is this, right? Uh -huh. That um, you're absolutely right, but your story is not unique. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my book talks in Liberia, um, sometimes I would begin by asking people, I say, how many people in here, both of your parents are from the same ethnic group? And very few hands will go up. It will not be the majority. You know what I yeah. mean? Same ethnic group. So the few hands will go up. That tells you that there's been a lot of intermarrying in our history. Mm -hmm. Then I'll say, okay, how many of you, all four of your grandparents were from the same ethnic group? And the hands start coming down. Because historically, there has been this ongoing mixing. Yes. But we and I, we, we, we either are not aware, some people are not aware of it. Um, 
and uh, and then some who are aware they will try to you know uh, uh, downplay it. You follow? The thing about ethnicity or, or quote unquote tribe mm -hmm. is it is like water. When you are in a situation of conflict, like a war, it freezes. Then everybody is taking side, right? Mm -hmm. My group, your group, you know, uh, and then we are not mixing. We can't, it's, it's inconceivable. But if there is no war and the ethnicity is at the normal temperature, then that ice will melt and you start to see things flowing this way and that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that part of the history has to be, you know, something that we recover. I, I could go through all kinds of, you know, family names and stuff to show you how people have been mixing in Liberia over hundred or something years, but it, it takes more than just giving one or two examples because if somebody's mind is locked, they will not receive it. But I say to the audience, look at your own family stories and look at their friends' stories around you and look at the reality that is Liberia. That small place, 43,000 square miles, mm. how could our ancestors have survived if they were only intermarrying within their own group? You know, in, in a, 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 on a, a biological level, you would have problems. You marry yeah. your sister, your cousin, your whatever. So I'll be getting into marrying for as long as we've been together. And it's it I it's funny because when there are people you meet and they tell you where they're from and they be like, oh, and they be like, oh, you okay, have my aunt, uncle, married to that person, dad, and and you guys. That's why all all my friends uh, are in college. Just say all the Liberians are related. Mm -hmm. said, I don't understand you guys. You guys are all related because everybody is somebody's cousin or somebody's mm -hmm. uncle or somebody's auntie. Mm -hmm. And so when we say that, that's why for me, that's why I tell people, I said, that's why I love like Liberians. I love my, like, I love to be around Liberians. I enjoy everything about Liberia. I, it's because I just feel that we're just an amazing group of people. Yeah. And so I just want to, I want to see if we can just do a few um, talk on the Liberian culture, the Liberian traditional culture. Because for us who, you know, you grew up in Monrovia, you, da, 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 you come to America, you really lose that tradition. The only thing I have is my Liberian English, which I'm really scared that it's fading away a little bit. Mm. But, <laughs> but that's what I have. And so, you know, um, I'm like, I was telling you earlier, I went to a Liberian wedding and I saw them, you know, giving money. Like the thing, and I was like, Liberians don't do that. That's not our thing. Like tradition, we don't flash money. That's a Nigerian thing. So yeah. I just want you know, just to get some, I'm uh, guessing insight and stuff like that on the Liberian culture. Like, is there a unique thing when it comes to Liberian culture or tradition? Uh, there are shared underlying elements to the culture. That's how we put it. You know, you 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 have some deep rooted similarities, but how the culture gets expressed, right? It will come out in different ways here and there. Okay. Are you following me? Yeah. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, three cultures are traditionally important. It just so happens coincidentally that all three of those col uh, colors are important. They are in the flag. Mm. Red is associated, yeah. So red, traditionally, I'm saying in indigenous Liberian cultures, yeah. is associated with blood, with power, maximum power, right? It has a spiritual significance because of that. Mm -hmm. um, it was reserved. So only certain people who you know were regarded as having immense uh, uh, power and, and, and deep knowledge would be allowed to wear red. Oh, wow. White was associated with purity, with clean, with, you know, with, 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 with a spiritual uh, uh, experience. And you'll see when the young women came out of the Sandy society, they would have white clay on, on them, yeah. symbolizing that. Oh, wow. And there are many other places where white is used just to, to signify that. 
you go to share cola with somebody, you take the white cola, you split it, you know, eh, your person take one thing, you know, white was a, a sign that th those values. Blue it also has spiritual significance, but that spirituality is related to water. And from the Liberian context in West Africa in general, Mami water is a mythical, you know, figure who is connected to water, right? But there are yeah. other forces like that that were connected to water. So water had power, you know, and uh, and those three colors were really critical to the pantheon of West African spirituality and within the context of Liberia. So you just see them being used in different ways in the art and in other ways, you know, in that in in that form. Um, now. The, f the problem that we face, and this is one of the reasons why I told you in the beginning, I say, you know, I'm an Africanist and I don't apologize, okay? Don't apologize. Is that um, at the core of most culture is the religion, is their is their, their, their spiritual base. And ours came to be demonized by Europeans. Mm. So when the Portuguese arrived, they started, they saw the, the um, ritual masquerades performing they say, oh, look at those country devils. They call the artifacts that people carved and they were using um, in rituals, they said those are fetishes, meaning false gods. Mm -hmm. Those ideas have been here from the 1400s in Liberia. And we have internalized them. We look at ourselves through the eyes of other people who look down on us. Yeah. So our traditions that are associated with spirituality are demonized. Oh, that witchcraft, that this, that this. But we cannot move the veil from our eyes to understand that it is not demonic. People can use any power in a negative or positive way. Nuclear power, you can generate electricity or you can use it and bomb an entire city, right? Yeah, I mean, any power, any you take, you, you take uh, um, a pharmaceutical, you know, uh, drugs, and you, you ask, you, the doctor prescribes a second dosage. You take that dosage again, it can cure you. You take too much of it, it can harm you. Yeah. So, so if we see people using the power in demonic way, that's them. But to demonize the entire culture because of it is a problem, and. Uh, so that, that's part of what, why, you know, we have had a problem understanding the culture because it has been so demonized for so long that people don't go back and they, they know, you know, some of what's going on. And I'm so glad that you talk about that. I have a friend who doing a research on West African spirituality and he's doing it for himself. For him, yeah. it's like he needs to understand yeah. This Christian thing, and then our religion when it comes to African religion. And when I'm saying he's doing an extensive research, there's sometimes we're talking on the phone, and I'd be like, I gotta go. Because what you're talking about, it sounds like voodoo. I can't do this right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it's and he's like, This is what I'm talking about. I'm mm -hmm. telling you about authentic African tradition, spiritual tradition. And the first thing that comes to your head is voodoo. It's witchcraft. It's not witchcraft. What do you think our people forefathers did before the Europeans brought their, he, he calls it now, their white god mm -hmm. to our people? What do you think mm -hmm. they were doing? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, you brought this up, and I just feel it's like it's so important. I don't know if there's, if you know of any way that we can read on it or anywhere that we can go to get more information where we can really understand our tradition when it comes to spirituality. So there's a chapter in that uh, Kola Forest book, uh, yes. the history of librarians before um, 1800. Mm -hmm. And the chapter is called the way of the ancestors. Okay. The way, like the path. Okay. The path. okay. Right? And the, the, the phrase, I didn't make it up. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase in traditional culture that people use to describe what Westerners would call religion. Because in our context, religion was not a separate domain, right? The, the, the ancestors were the ones who paved the way and they knew best. So it was in our interest to follow the way that they had made. And they handed it down to us, not in books, 
you know, we didn't have the, the, the system of, of, of writing and what have you. Um, but it handed them down to us in a way, in, by other means, and we needed to live by them. So there were people who were expected to carry that wisdom to the next generation. You follow? Yes. And their wisdom was embedded in all types of folk tales that we would share as a culture, right? With the new generations. Mm -hmm. Do you remember spider stories? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so spider stories exist in West Africa from Senegal all the way passing through Liberia to Ghana. Then the people who were taken from West Africa and brought to the Caribbean and the, the Americas, you have spider story Anansi in Jamaica and parts of the Caribbean, right? Wow. So what's spider story? Spider stories are in effect morality lessons for children. Spider was greedy. Spider mm -hmm. was antisocial. Spider was selfish. And you're using this character who is a trickster to tell the children, don't be like Spider. Are you following me? Yeah. We laugh at Spider. Uh, he's entertaining, but we know at the end of the day, all his tricks and all I think he will pay for it. Karma will get him. So the body of Spider's stories was one way in which the ancestors were instructing the coming generation to say, don't do this. Don't be like that. You know what I mean? And we threw all of that away. So then how are our children going to follow, you know, the right lessons and, and, and learn right from wrong and, and, and so forth in, in, in ways that were entertaining, relaxing, funny, but on a deep level, uh, teaching you morality. So we may not have had writing systems, but the folktales were a way of transmitting those values and they transmitted those values in a lot of different ways. Um, but it was the way of the ancestors that were going past them. And I like that you brought this up because one something I wanted to talk about was um, you being an educator as well. Why aren't our history thought to us in the eyes of our people? Because when I look back in history class, all we talked about was like the ACS. We talk about all the things that the, the settlers did when it came to Liberia. Then I remember us doing ancient Egypt. So we actually learned about ancient Egypt. So why isn't there a way like, I, I'm just saying, is there a way that this book can be given into the Liberian history curriculum so that the Liberian students can really read this book and understand who we are so we can know where we're going? Uh, you know, when I was working on the book and I was working on all my other, you know, writings, that was my wish. That was my hope. But I would say to you, to be quite honest, I don't see that happening. Mm. And that's partly because our librarian book people, we are, we don't read. Isn't that ironic? Mm. You know, and when we don't read for, as a source of knowledge of it, uh, you know, uh, yeah then um, it's hard for us to be able to, to teach. So that's the conundrum that we are in now. Um, the hope that I have is that there are some in your generation who will decide to break this curse because it is a curse. It is. It is a curse. You cannot show me any society in the world today. I'm talking about in a complex world mm -hmm. where the leaders don't read. And many of the best leaders, they don't only read, they write. Yeah. I will show you a picture of Barack Obama in the bookstore buying books with his girls or the books that he wrote. You go to the office of the president of Ghana, the office is filled with books. They're not for show. The man yeah. reads. He looks for the best and knowledge, policies, approaches from everywhere in the world to bring it to bear in his country. Rwanda, forget it. The, the leaders of Rwanda are, I mean, ferocious readers. Ethiopia, same thing. In Ethiopia, the amount of books that are sold is, un, is, is incredible compared to Liberia. You know the joke in Liberia? They say, you want to hide something from Liberia, man? Put it in a book. Put it in a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. And it's true. I haven't done that before. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Nobody I'm going 
Go on. Let me tell you that joke. So you know, they say when you go to Liberia, you know the people in the, the house where you they can steal. So you have to protect your money that you bring. So what I did was yep. I put my money in a book. Yes, exactly. And I put it on my brother's bookshelf. And yes. I told you it was 200 US dollars. That yep. money stayed there from the day I got there until the day I was leaving. And then I called the children and I yep. opened the book and I took the money out. Everybody yep. started laughing. They're like, you did I say, I said this. <laughs> Nobody looked in that book. Yeah. So I would say, I would say uh, EJ, that um, we have a short time mm -hmm. to break the curse. Yeah. If we don't do it, I'm sorry, you know, the consequences will be dire. We have a short time to break the curse. And I'm hoping that those in your generation, some of you will agree to step up to do it. Because when you know who you are and you know where you're coming from, there's a power that will carry you forward. You understand me? It will propel you. I, the example I will give to you, your audience is, uh, think about the Ghanaians a year of return. The Ghanaians made 2 billion, close to 2 billion US dollars. Doing what? Using history. History. It was not a, a pleasant history. It was not, you know, uh, uh, something that people will be proud of. It is the transatlantic slave trade. But they own their history. They took it. And they said, you know what? We're going to turn this around. So that means then that the politicians who were putting this policy together, they understood history. They, are, they have to understand it, the value of it. They surround themselves with people. They say, okay, we want to carry this thing. I want to sell it to Beyonce and to to Jay-Z and all these guys so they can come. The people who want to do the selling, they need to appreciate history as well. And so what I'm saying to you is that society made two billion US dollars off of what? History. We don't like to, to, to say that and Liberians don't think of it that way. So the minute we saw the Ghanaians make money, we said, oh, we want some, some money too. We'll do tourism. But you don't know your, your culture, you don't know your history. How are you going to get people to come here to, to, to do what? But we the point start is, with the basics. There were Liberians who flew from Liberia to go to Ghana to do the, the, the year of return. Yes, yes, of course. Because, because I remember being at the airport and going to Liberia that year, and then when we got, I'm like, why are they going to like everybody going to Ghana? I'm like, why yeah. you guys going to Ghana? I go to Liberia to my friends, and I'm like, going to Ghana, and I'm like, you have a year of return. I said, the people are showcasing their history. They yeah. are showcasing everything about their country and you're going to take your money and go to support them and you got all this rich history. Yeah. So, like I, I think it's 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 sad that we are at the place, but I still at the end of the day, I still feel that you know, yep, yeah, it's our generation, and I applaud you as an elder, I applaud you as somebody who is trying to educate us. But can there be more of you? Can we clone you? So we can get more of you to help us understand who we are. Because I think what you are doing, there are a lot of, of our elders who aren't taking the time to do that for us. So what I would say, what, what I, would, I, I would share with you, Erwin, um, and your audience as well, right? Is that over the last year, I've been working with a number of people who we're going to put together a commemoration next year of Liberia, right? It will be year long. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to break the generational curse, the mentality of negativity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and we can do it. But you see, we tend to put emphasis on politics and flashiness. Mm -hmm. That misses the important stuff, in my view. And the important stuff, they are less tangible and they consist of things like history, the arts and culture. So once we, we can shift our mind in that direction, that's the key to unlocking where we need to go. All right, so what we plan to do is we'll do commemorations throughout the year that will highlight, will spotlight the positive side of our story. Mm -hmm. We have to understand it. And you know what? Agree. We have to understand 
understand it. And then when we do, how empowering it is. When I was in Liberia, I staged a play based on a, a history uh, book that I, I wrote. And the reaction of the young people was just incredible. People are hungry for positive messages wow. about Liberia and Liberians. We don't know, uh, for example, the discovery of cola, which is ubiquitous in West Africa. It's yeah. a part of the culture. It's embedded in the culture. It's a sign of hospitality. It's a, a gift that you offer when you go to the grave of a loved one you know, who has passed, stuff like that. Um, it comes from us, from our ancestors. Um, they originally, you know, when, when a group of people are identified with selling something, their name gets attached to that thing. So the area where the Gola people in Liberia live is where some of the best Gola was found. And they started trading it, selling it. But, you know, we take it to be like something not important. Yeah. It's a discovery. It's a discovery. You have to be able to sample some uh, uh, seed from nature and realize that, oh, it has these properties. You're testing like a pharmaceutical product on yourself. Yes. You say, oh, it suppresses thirst. It suppresses hunger. Ah, it stimulates. You know what? I will sell it to the other man. And the thing spread across West Africa. That's, that's our heritage. Um, when the Portuguese came to Liberia and West Africa, they had no idea. They, they knew how to do sales on ships and stuff and they were inching their way down the coast. They didn't know our Atlantic Ocean the way our people knew it. Yeah. We had lived there for centuries, we knew. So in the Atlantic Ocean, there are two currents. They are like rivers in, in the ocean. Mm -hmm. One current, which is close to the shore, is running um, from west, I'm sorry, from east to west. So if you, take, if you get in that current in Cape Mao, it will carry you to Sino, carry you, it can carry you to Cote d'Ivoire, and so on. And when the Portuguese were coming, they would get in that stream, and the current would be carrying them, whether or not the sail, the air, the wind was, was, was helping. Time for them to go back, it would be a problem. Wow. A lot of their ships crashed along the coast of West Africa. Some of them were loaded with gold or wherever, it crashed. It was our crew ancestors who said to them, but wait now, there's another current out in the ocean. It's going the opposite way. And mm. if your ship goes in that current, it will carry you for a distance. And we know from the historical record, there were many, many crew men mainly who were hired on ships, you know, throughout the, the period after Europeans came. They were on the, the British naval ships that were intercepting the slave trade as well. So. Our knowledge, our maritime knowledge, you know, or knowledge of the ocean, these are some of the things that we don't we don't credit. Uh, if we can take these nuggets and broadcast them to Liberians, believe me, we we'll do this consistently. We we'll take our cuisine, look at the cuisine, look at look. I mean, we're just sitting on these gifts. We broadcast them over consistently over a year. Look at our music. By the end of it. Believe me, minds would have been changed from this negative mindset to something completely different. And my last word on this point, uh, EJ, is this. We need to get over this hang up about something came from this place some, and the other thing was always here. Uh, Cassava is not indigenous to Liberia. Mm. It came from Brazil. You see? But if you go to Brazil today and you carry cassava leaf, and you carry Dumbo or Fufu, the Brazilians will be shocked. <laughs> what, makes, what makes that cassava uh, unique for us is what the creativity you know, and innovation our ancestors applied. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to be taking claim for, not the indigenousity or the foreignness of something. It's like wherever something came from, what do you do with it? And the example of it, we can, we can look at cassava or we can look at hipco. Look at what young men and, and, and women in Liberia without money, without access to privilege, can yes. take hip hop, fuse it with local music and produce something completely dazzling you know, for the world. So that's where I'm coming from on this. And this 
was amazing. We are like, I'm getting texts. You guys are over time. I'm like, no, we have to do this. Gotta finish this. <laughs> but this has been amazing. I tell you, for me as a person who I love my country, I love Liberia. I said all the time, all my friends know I'm moving to Liberia. They already know that. Like, so why are you moving? I'm like, I'm gonna move. I move, yeah, but I'm going to move. I know that's gonna happen. Um, somebody said, yes, Liberia has the best rice sauces. <laughs> And she's Nigerian, by the way. <laughs> but I tell you, talk about Jollof. Um, I mean, they have this Jollof Fest every year in D.C. Liberia always wins. Right. Like, And that's what I'm so proud of about my country. I'm so happy that you came to share this experience with us. This is what Liberian excellence is all about. We are ready. So I just want for the last question, what's next for you? Yeah, so the next is really uh, this project for next year. Okay. Um, w w w I've been on, on Clubhouse talking to some people. We'll be, you know, we're taking this to another level, right? We've been working behind the scenes preparing some of the materials that we'll need to use. Um, we're working, one of the projects we're working on is a, is a documentary on Liberian cuisine. Oh. Yeah. And so there's a, a young woman um, with expertise in that area who's going to spearhead that project. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure we can put some of these uh, projects together. If we use the arts, right, um, we're going to do a poetry festival in Liberia, spoken word poetry. But the theme is going to be about bigging up Liberia, you know. Liberia might be loving. Um, we're not talking the negative stuff this for this year, that year that's coming. Yes. We're going to break, you know. We had a war, right? EJ, we know this, right? It was tragic. Yeah. It was it was it was horrendous. But at some point, even the warlords and the, the fighters cease fire. They put the arms down. Right? And for now, for the last um, uh, more than uh, 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 12 years going, we have not had guns firing like that. Yes. Well, what has not happened is that Liberians on social media, Facebook, all these places, have not ceased fire with verbal attacks on each other. So we're going to call that ceasefire okay. next year. You hear me? We're ready. And, and we're going to put out messages that are positive, that will shift our mindset. And we are so ready for that. I tell you, I, number one, my team is ready for this because this is why we are here. We need for people to really see the authentic Liberia, the great things that have come out of Liberia. And that's why mm -hmm. I named this month Liberia Excellence because mm -hmm. a lot of people, last week I had Macy, Don Padmo, who is an opera singer. And mm -hmm. all my friends are like, like, we have a Liberian opera singer? Yes! Yeah. Are you guys kidding me? We have all these amazing people. There are people like this person who writes, she's like, oh my God, I'm so excited to hear about Liberia history. Like, I'm enjoying this conversation. There are people who have never heard certain things. They're all Liberian. And so I say thank you for being here about what time is up. Yes. We're thank you. Have to do this again. Thank <laughs> I really you so much. appreciate, appreciate you for coming. <laughs> this was great. I learned so much and I want to say thank you. If, if, I know I said the last thing, but I still want to ask you one more last thing. For a Liberian boy or a Liberian girl who's trying to get the way out and find who they are, what is it that you can tell them right now? To, to, they're trying to do what? They're just trying to find out who they are as a Liberian. For a little boy or a little girl in Liberia who can't really you know, figure out what can I do who am I as a Liberian? Like, what is it that you can tell them? Hmm. Well, you know, they, they have to access knowledge and there's no way around it. You have to access knowledge. And if there are knowledgeable people in your environment, then those are people you need to consult. You know, you need to, to pick them their brains about these things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, And then if you can read, you know, definitely you want to access that knowledge that's available in, in, in books. But it's it's not just it's not just that. I'll tell you, I had um, when I was living in Liberia, I'm going back uh, in November. I came across remarkable individuals who were extremely talented, they're top of their game, but they
taught themselves what they know. Mm -hmm. A young man took pictures for me. He took many, many uh, 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 photos that were posted on Facebook. And whenever they were up, people would come and say, oh, these are beautiful photos. You know, um, if they were in the picture, they wanted a copy and all of that. And the first set of pictures he took when he came by to bring the copies for me to see, I asked him where he got his training. And he said, Pape, I learned on YouTube. Wow. So here's yeah, somebody who has the, the drive. He used to draw. And as a kid, someone saw that. And he said, hey, let me get you this small camera. Uh, and you will be able to take picture. And you know, like you draw a picture, you take picture with a camera. He started doing it. And he was turned on by it. But how to learn about f-stop and aperture. He went on YouTube, my brother. The data costing you an arm and a leg, you know, the yeah, internet yeah. is unreliable, but the brother taught himself on YouTube. Knowledge is power. We need to access it. And a lot of it is buried in books. Yep. Amen. Dr. Bars, All right, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. We said thank you for joining us and having this amazing conversation. Uh, we hope to have you here again. And I tell you, when I'm in Liberia in December, we're going to have a conversation. All right. All right. Okay. Look forward to it. Thanks Thank again. Bye-bye. So okay. bye to you. Bye. I told you guys it was going to be a great conversation. Dr. Boris is amazing. If you have not had the opportunity to ask you, it's on Amazon. It's on everywhere. You can go to buy a book. It's called Between the Color Forest and Salty Sea, a history of the Liberian people before 1800. You're a Liberian. If you're not a Liberian and you really want to know about the Liberian history, I ask, I tell you, go and get this book. Again, we are on Facebook, The Conversation I Spoken Opinionated. We are on YouTube, The Conversation I Spoken Opinionated. We are on Spotify within the next 10, 15 minutes. This episode will be on Spotify. I ask you to go and download it. But without any further conversation, Liberian people, if you are in Liberia, go and get a vaccine if you can get a vaccine. You are not giving me a hard time today. Secondly, we're asking, please protect yourself. Wear your mask, do your hand sanitizing, everything that you can do. This was the conversation. We were celebrating Liberia excellence. We were celebrating Liberia takeover with Dr. Patrick Boris. I ask you to tune again next week. We have an amazing guest. She has blown the Liberian tourist uh, uh, um, thing down, Chiquita. I mean, this is somebody who packed the bags and moved to Liberia because she loved Liberia tourism. So I tell you, join us next week at 7 o'clock. It's going to be great. But you guys, have a great time, and I'll see you next week, Thursday.